Welcome to LARP Academia, and you, my friend, have finally made it. You've made it to 6th level wizard. Now, we've talked about in other classes how, oh, as a druid, you have these different playstyle options. And as a healer, you could be a front, back, midline healer, whatever else, regenerating warrior. As a wizard, we haven't really gone into those options because up until this point, you don't really have a playstyle other than I choose to go a little bit more control or a little bit more offense. I choose to go a little bit more verbally or I go or I go a little bit more spellball, but you still have all those tools. At six level is finally when your kit can change. Now the first way how we're going to change your kit is to strip away those nasty spell balls. As you can see, I have a little tethered dagger and I have a short sword. Why is this? Well, it's because I have chosen the archetype Battle Mage. Now, unlike with every other archetype for every other class, instead of just penalizing you for taking something else, doubling the point cost, whatever, you're just straight unable to take those other options as a wizard, which is the most punishing. Why? Well, about half your spells are unavailable to you. You do not have the option to purchase enchantments or spell balls. You're just verbal heavy. There's a few things to take into account when choosing this option. As a battle mage, verbals will go quickly. You are able to go through 15 verbals in a minute. I've done so. Why? You have Amulet, you can keep moving. Amulet, I commend this up, I commend this up, I commend this up. Amulet, you, I commend this press. Amulet, you, I commend this up, I commend this up, I commend this up. Amulet, you, my pirate chelsea, my pirate chelsea, my pirate chelsea. Amulet, you, Destructs at the right arm, Destructs at the right arm, Destructs at the right arm. Amulet, you, Destructs at the right arm, 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 Amulet, you, I commend this up, I commend this up, I commend this up. Amulet, and you get the idea. You can just keep rattling off spells like this. Now, some battle mages try to go with the per refresh route where whoa we're gonna make our spells count we've already talked about quantity over quality in level four you want quantity so uh, you'll probably want a lot of per lives as a battle mage not not saying you shouldn't take any per refreshes not saying you shouldn't have a kill combo in fact my recommended kill combo is hold person and drag below that's why I was saying so many hold person in cans as a battle mage since that's your only real one well you can do astral intervention and drag below but Hold person allows you to do more things. So I would recommend to uh, have a sustainable kill combo and to make it so that your spells are replenishable. I have seen many other wizards go out there and say, oh, I'm going to be a warlock battle mage. And they're pretty much useless because they're getting a lot, they're getting rid of a lot of the versatility. Now, battle mage has a specific set of uses. Battle Mage is useful in small skirmishes. It can be 15, even 20 people when it's still very useful. And it has to be sustainable. This is the problem with Battle Mage and verbals. You can run out very quickly, then you can't do stuff. You'll sit on the sidelines charging all the time. It's not a very good option. So you either, and this is my bread and butter, oh, I, I did the most wicked game where I was able, where there was 10 people on each side and I was able to make up for seven people, making seven people unable to play because the circumstances fit my battle mage. If you have low to no death count and unlimited lives, battle mage is amazing. Why? You kill yourself or you die, you come back and you're good. Someone else dies on your team, cool. Steal life and then you can keep doing your kill combos. That low kill count is important. Now if it's a normal game where you have 60 seconds, even 45, possibly 30, it's too long for you to get back your per lives. It, you're spending 60 seconds dead, 40, 30. You don't want to do that. You want to get out on the battlefield and make a difference. And in that time, the healers are erecting or doing whatever they are to counter your good work out there. So you need to find a way to make it sustainable. The only way that I've really found to make it sustainable is to uh, meet a good bard friend, see if they took restoration and they cast restoration on you giving you back pretty much all your spells so you can keep going on an infinite way that's the only way to make it really sustainable for big battle games but if your battle game is big with a lot of people it's not skirmish based it's just constant fighting and there is a 45 or higher second death count it shouldn't be a consideration in your mind if you don't have a bard friend it's very hard to maintain you uh, will be out of your spells and that is the weakness of battle mage the strength again is on skirmishes now why skirmishes not only because you won't run out of spells as quickly but because you are able to uh, 
engage one-on-one. -on -one. You, you won't be able to always have your teammates. You'll need to run around, dash around, and you'll need to move with ambulance. And that's what makes ambulance so good. The reason why I have a tethered dagger to myself is because when you go battle mage, you don't need to do this awkward scenario. Oh, someone's coming at me. Uh, 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 now I got, now I got it. Instead, all you need to do is this. Step back. All I needed to do with a little tether, I made it so that there's a knot on my arm. Well, this is an enchantment trip. And I tied a knot onto the dagger. There's a different type of knot where you can adjust the tight, well, the tightness and the looseness of it. And all I need to do then is once it's tethered to me, step back. I don't ever need to switch swords or anything with a battle mage. I just need a free hand so I can cast while running with another sword. If someone's coming at me and I don't think I can deal with it, then I can get my dagger up there. It doesn't even matter. I could just choke it or anything else. I just need to be able to have my dagger in order to block. Now, I will say that a short sword and a dagger is still not the best. It's close to a single short, but it gives you an option as a wizard. Don't tether a short sword and a long sword, not only because of points, but because swinging up a short sword is a lot harder than swinging up a dagger. It's more dangly to get in the way. And I would just recommend a short sword and a dagger. This is only if you're comfortable with this style. I myself have gotten very good with a short sword and a dagger. I, I almost prefer a short sword and a dagger over Florentine, two short swords. I'm fi fighting against someone who has a sword and board like this. I'm fine fighting against someone who has a single short like this. Against flow, a pull, eh, I should probably rely on spells more so. And I still want to rely on spells. This is a backup. You still want to go out there and just start casting at everyone, and you should only pull it up kind of to do an offensive bit as you back off and get away. You shouldn't really go in. No more than three seconds, I would say, in a fight with a single short and a dagger. You are at an innate disadvantage, and you can fight with this, but I would not recommend it. Again, the reason why I'd recommend it here over the other places, though, is because it's a much easier transition rather than... Oh, 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 and and going like that for spell balls or just out of natural instinct because you want your right hand. When you have it like this, it's more natural to have your left hand be the pointer finger. Now, Elemental Barrage is an interesting spell. It makes it so that you have Ambulant while casting spell balls, and it also makes you have Swift while casting spell balls. Actually, it's better than Swift. All you need to do is say the name. So, for example, I'm filled with the power of magic, Lightning Bolt. Sphere of Annihilation. And I did that while moving. It's pretty awesome because my ongoing effect is so great. And I also have these little things here. I have a spell ball to throw. I have the bouquet of death. I can fit way more spell balls into this. And Elemental Barrage is an interesting option that you have that's actually quite powerful. There are some notes that you want to take on Elemental Barrage, though. Elemental Barrage is a powerful spell that's on a timer. So uh, why I say it's on a timer is that as I throw a spell ball, I can't pick it up. If I pick up the spell ball, oh no, my Elemental Barrage instantly ends. So you only have as many spell balls that are on your person. If spell balls fall out, that's a problem. Something other important with Elemental Barrage, something very important with Elemental Barrage, is that you want to have an organized spell ball kit. Why have these three bags? Or for me to know that force balls are here. My control spell balls, uh, whether it's ice ball and tangle or both are here. Suppression bolt doesn't exist. I have lightning bolt here, fireball here, phase bolt here. Why do I do this? Well, have you ever seen an evoker We'll talk about Evoker in a sec, but have you ever seen a person who has just a giant sack and they start pulling out spell balls and they say, fireball, lightning bolt, ice ball. That's, that's pretty cool. Their Santa Claus are giving people gifts of death. But the problem with that is, let's say a barbarian is charging you and you have a full set of spell balls. You have 37 spell balls, probably. You have four lightning bolts, four fireballs, four phase bolts. Uh, you have 12 force bolts, and you have probably have around six ice balls and six entangles. Now, I reach into that pouch. The barbarian's charging me. I have 12 spell balls that are force bolts, six spell balls that are entangles, six spell balls that are ice balls, four spell balls that are phase bolts. That means that I have 28 spell balls out of my 37 that will not do anything. 
That's more than 50%. And uh, I'm not much of a gambling man, but even if you are, you have to admit, those are pretty poor odds to pull out a spell ball and have it do nothing at a barbarian charging at you with a shield. So you can do what I do and have your spell balls organized. I know if a barbarian is charging at me, I can reach in lightning bolt here. I also know how many lightning bolts I have from the field. I know how many fireballs I have if I want to destroy those shields. I know how many phase bolts if things are getting dicey and there's a lot of monks around and I want to back off. I can feel, just with my arm, how many or around how many force bolts or entangle slash ice balls there are. And I can judge what I want to do based on that number. It also gives me the option to pull out accurately what I want. Barbarians charging me and I want to stop them so I can live. Lightning bolt. Very quick, very simple. And instead of me just going in and praying to the RNG gods and, and probably not having my prayers answered because the probability of it actually working is very low. So that is something very important that you need to take into note with Elemental Barrage. We'll talk a little bit more about that with Evoker. Now on to Evoker. If you didn't watch our Elemental Barrage section, please do. It covers a lot of things. It's awesome. They're very synergistic because Evoker makes it so that you can only purchase the verbals that are at range of touch. I, oh, that's it. Which means most of our verbals aren't worth anything. And you are able to have essentially unlimited Elemental Barrage by making it charge times 10. That's really all it does, is it gives you charge times 10 elemental barrage. That's, that's it, that's it. That means that you can be a track star forever. You can go out there and say that, you know what? I just bought my balls, and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to throw my balls at people because I have so many balls to give. Balls all day. Balls, balls. And that is what Evoker is about, your balls. Now, Evoker has a very specific time that it's useful. I would say that Battle Mage has more uses or overall uses than Evoker, the reason being. You generally are able to charge a spell ball, aim, then throw. You don't need this rapid fire. When you rapid fire, you don't generally think. Most people don't have these nice little pouches to know where your spell balls are at and how many you have. They're not constantly calculating and thinking what they could do, the percentages, the chances, and everything else while they're going. They go out there and they just pull lightning bolt, fireball, and they don't really care. If you uh, take a spell ball, the flame swords of mind evoke, the flame swords of mind evoke, the flame swords of mind evoke, take your target and then throw, is it really that different than lightning bolt? I mean, there wasn't that much of a time difference, and you're not going to want to just rapid fire all your spell balls because one, you have to pick them up, and two, you can't pick them up while you're in Elemental Barrage. So you want to still ration your spell balls if that's the only thing you have, which makes Evoker far less appealing. In fact, it's almost more appealing to just take Elemental Barrage once or twice and not have Evoker. But th there are instances for when you want Evoker. You see, Evoker, or Elemental Barrage, is the most damage output in the entire game. It's more than any Sword Knight going against noobs, because you're constantly throwing a bunch of spell balls, and you're either crowd controlling, or killing, or wounding, or whatever with these spell balls. And you don't need any downtime. You also have the benefit of range that you can have. It's pretty wonderful. And Evoker is best used when you are trying to break through an area. If there is a point that needs to be held, a bridge, a castle drawbridge, anything else, a doorway, something that needs to go down and there are too many people for you to engage in melee or to make it so that you can flank or do anything else, just a fortified position. Evoker is that one that will just break through those areas and they can do so all game long. So if you have a bridge, a fortified position, king of the hill, anything like that, Evoker is very good for those situations. If there's not a fortified area, most of the time, evokers hang on to their spell balls long enough that Elemental Barrage doesn't honestly have a purpose. It looks cool. It looks cool to reach near Santa Sack and throw a bunch of spell balls, but it's, it doesn't have much of a purpose. You can just charge, pick out your target, throw, charge again, pick out your target, throw, and it doesn't change much. So Evoker is 
very conditional, like a lot of wizard archetypes. Now, finger of death. Finger of death is so great. It, it, it does everything that Icy Blast Shatter does in one spell. And you can't recharge it, which is unfortunate, but it's a screw you, you're dead. Now, this doesn't work on everyone because it's death and not sorcery, and there are some things you need to think about, but mostly it works on everyone. So, Finger of Death is a wonderful option. The only problem is that it is once per refresh, and that does kind of suck, especially as a 6 level spell. But we'll get into how to make that amazing in just a little bit. Now, Finger of Death was all about killing people, which is what you are meant to do as a wizard. Well, kill or control. Persist is where all your enchantments, you know, all, all five of them, you'll see the fifth one soon, is now able to last all game until this spell at the low, low cost of two points. And you get it once per refresh. Here, let's get this at one point, and it's one per life for all their enchantments. You're probably only going to persist, either Void Touch or the spell we're going to talk about in a little bit. And another class already gets pro match, so you're going to persist Void Touch, and we've already talked about a, a little bit alluding to persistent Void Touch, which is how you keep it to stay and be worth it, but you're just making a single enchantment cost three points to be worth it, and that's usually what you want to do if you want to actually give out Void Touch. And three, three points of, uh, of high-level magic, so two points per refresh. Wow! Great job, great job. It's, it's absolutely terrible. The only time to take it is with Void Touch, and even then, it's two points. That's why it's just so bad when you compare it to healers or even druids can make other things persistent with golem. It's just, we got shafted hard when it comes to persist and other enchantments. And even though it is useful, even though it should probably be red, because it is two points of your six level magic for one to maybe two spells, oh, it's just, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating for us to even take. And really, it's just bad and it feels terrible when we take it. Now, one reason why you'd want to take it is protection from magic. We talked about Void Touch, yes. Protection from magic is your fifth enchantment that you get. Out of six levels, you have five enchantments. Most are garbage. Pro Madge makes it so that someone is immune to magic. What do you do? Not you, someone else. So it doesn't help you it helps someone else. It is very powerful, which is why it's orange. But if you're going to give someone pro Madge, you're probably going to persist it. It's going to take three points of six level magic to do so. And we talked about how wizards are selfish creatures. We want our spell list to synergize about killing other people. We're not meant to help our teammates. So pro Madge is very powerful. We have the option to persist it. Then honestly, three pro mages might be better than a pro mage and a persist. That's how bad persist is for us. So, pro mage is an option. It is powerful, but it's just not something we'd really want to take. Now, something that we do want to take is sphere of annihilation. The main problem with sphere is that you are spending. It is the only spell ball that costs two points, and you're getting one spell ball for it. The reason being, though is that it is the best of all the offensive spell balls. Mm, Phase Bolt has some one-uppings on it, but we'll talk about that. Now, Sphere has everything that Fireball does, but better. If someone is hit, they die, and they're cursed. Sphere also ignores all ongoing enchantments on equipment like shields. So if a shield has Imbue shield on it. Well, it's gone. Who cares? We don't care about your stuff. It ignores it ignores those enchantments. Very rarely comes into play, but it's it's a thing. The thing that mostly comes into play with Sphere of Annihilation is that it does everything that a fireball does, but it's sorcery and it ignores armor. So let's say a warrior comes out six points ancestral armor. <laughs> Sphere hits them on the chest. Ancestral armor. You're dead. It's like point. No, you're dead. It's like point. Doesn't affect that. You're dead. Like, as they're confused because it, their ancestral should affect spell walls, but your sphere doesn't care. They're dead. Now, aside from warriors and making them cry, which is always wonderful, this is also very good for monsters who are not immune to sorcery. Sorcery is the hardest immunity to get in the game. Let's say a monster goes out, I have six points of natural armor, or natural ancestral armor, sectional. You just hit them with a sphere anywhere, they're dead. Sphere is very good, very powerful. Problem, 
you throw it, it... I can't really grab another one, and I have to go get it, which, yeah, I don't know if I want to go and get it, and you have to really plan where you throw your spell balls. You generally want to do this in a bigger battle game where you want to try to conserve your spell balls mostly to try and find on the front line so you can pick them up. But Sphere is an even bigger exception where you want to kind of throw it when they're on your line, maybe at a warrior, someone who has a lot of that armor that you can bypass, and it's very powerful and situational. Now, you can use it on anyone. It's, it's great because of that versatility, but getting it back, reusing it, two points of six level magic. That's why we can't recommend it all the time. That's why it's not purple, but it is still a very good spell ball. Spell ball. Now, Warlock. Up until now, we've discussed a bunch of different play styles. You have, up until level six, been subjected to only having your entire kit, not being able to really specialize that much. You don't have a very different play style. You can't base it off of skirmishing. You can't base it off of these areas that need to be breached more so. It's just, it's kind of a play style that's very versatile. Warlock has strangely a little bit of that. Now, the whole point of Warlock is that you strip away a lot of your verbal versatility. You make it so that you can only purchase Flame and Death and those are doubled. And that's true but you still have spell balls. Most warlocks forget this. Most warlocks end up saying, oh, well, I'm gonna be a battle mage warlock because that's the best way to utilize my kit. That is dumb. That is dumb. If you ever do a battle mage warlock, you're, you're probably the worst wizard out there because <laughs> they don't synergize that well. A wizard is all about synergy. Instead, think of it this way. I have an entangle. It's subdual, but it's a spell ball, so I can use it. I entangle someone, and then I use Drag Below. I purchase it once, I have two per refresh. I now go up, I steal life. Ooh, steal life is death, and it's a verbal, so I have four per life. I have four of those kill combos per life. Finger of Death is also, ooh, Finger of Death is also a death magic, so I can get eight of those. If I go Warlock and I spend my other four points and I have looked apart, then I have eight fingers of death. Ooh, that's pretty good. And if you've kind of got the idea, Warlock is all about killing. It is the best killing version of the wizard. Now you do have some things like pyro pyrotechnics, you have heat weapon, you could theoretically get destroy armor, purchase it once, I now have four per refresh, okay. Purchase it twice, I have eight per refresh, and it gives a reason to use that. But mainly, you are about killing people. You still have your force bolts. You still have your lightning bolt, fireballs, phase. You could get sphere, I wouldn't recommend sphere. But you also have your other spell balls to control. I would recommend mainly taking entangle. And then you just have gone full in in murdering people. Now, Warlock is good in games when deaths matter. When you have unlimited lives, eh, it's very hard to justify in a 60 second death count game, you might have a good reason to take Warlock, but really in those games where lives matter, when, he, when people have a certain amount of lives and a quest, whatever else, Warlock is very good for murder. And this is only when, you know, murdering really matters. If you are playing a low death count game of 30 seconds or less, don't bother. 45 seconds, I wouldn't even bother then. And Warlock makes you have to do a few things in order to actually play it right. You can't just go out there and say, hey, I'm going to be a Warlock and I'm going to murder people like most of your lists do. In fact, most of your lists, if you're kind of figuring this out, you need to figure out from the game designer, hey, I just need to know two things. Death count, and do we have infinite lives? Then you can make your spell list. But as a warlock, you also need to talk to your teammates. You need to say, hey, is any wizard or any class that has a, a lot of dispel, like a druid, who taking a lot of naturalized magic, is anyone going to be able to dispel pretty much all of their enchantments? Because if I take warlock, I can't dispel, which is a very big deal. Taking Warlock could lose your team the game, and I know this sounds dramatic, but that's how, imp that's how important Dispel Magic is on a big battlefield especially. 
you need dispel magic, you need to coordinate with your teammates, and you need to use Warlock in the right situation, where all you need to do is kill and focus on it. In those situations, you can become a monster. Now, the last option you have is Word of Mending. The only reason why you would take it is because it's fun to say Spadoinkle, or if there's some game objectives like, oh, Siege Catapults or whatever, okay. That's the reason it takes Spadoinkle. If you have a six-point armored warrior, probably a druid's just getting really happy over there because of that and has their word of mending, but you could take it as a backup if you want. There are some reasons to take word of mending, but not much overall. Now, I would love to hear what you think of Wizard in general on 6th level. You finally have the ability to unlock archetypes and have different play styles. I know it's kind of weird as a wizard, but we also have the most punishing archetypes. So I would love to hear what you think. Do you like Wizard now? Do you like everything that you that has been presented to you? And if not, why not? Would you rather be a healer who helps people? If so, go have a conscience somewhere else. But until next time, don't forget to like, subscribe, and ding that notification bell so that you can stay up to date on more AmpGuard and LARPing material. Until next time, keep LARPing!